Good afternoon, good evening, and for some of you, even good morning, and, and welcome to this first webinar on, on shaping future ocean clusters, the view from Iceland and from Canada. So it's really a pleasure to, to welcome you, and I know we have uh, people signing in and people dialing from, from Costa Rica, from Canada, from all over Europe. We have people in Asia, we have people from Australia. We also know that a lot of people were quite excited about today, and, and so are we. Um, we have gathered very, very experienced people in the cluster space from Canada, from Iceland, and from Norway, as well as a global ocean impact accelerator to have what's really a conversation around how do we shape future ocean clusters. And we're very excited to have you guys join us. And as you know, this is, um, this is an, an, an important topic. Uh, an increasing number of countries are exploring and maybe also realizing the value potential in the ocean economy. From Mauritius to the uh, OECD, from Norway to South Africa, there's a, there's a growing realization that there's opportunity and value to be had from growing and sustainably growing the ocean economy. And in that regard, maritime clusters and, and ocean-based clusters may hold a very, very big part of the solution and how do we how do we grow this ocean economy in a sustainable and responsible manner because as, as most of us know there are significant challenges both in terms of overfishing pollution and of course plastics and other issues that we need to deal with so we're going to have a broad broad conversation around these topics and what role specifically various clusters play in that regard now a very brief housekeeping rule so please do ask any questions. We have uh, questions that we can take running during the discussions. And then we'll also have ample time for questions in Q&A towards the end. Second housekeeping rule, uh, this uh, webinar will be recorded. And unless something significant should happen, it'll be posted to YouTube and other social media channels. So feel free to have a conversation among friends as we proceed. My name is Christian Rangan. I've I've gotten the, the pleasure to, to host uh, this webinar. And as many of you probably know, this is a topic I'm quite passionate about. And, and we're really a topic we've been exploring now for a number of years of how do we build better and smarter and more sustainable innovation clusters. And we're really trying to learn as much as we can as we're writing the book coming out late next year on how do we build better clusters and super clusters for sustainable economic growth. So what we're going to cover today is myself and our good friend from Bergen, uh, Seafood Innovation Cluster Manager, is going to have a little bit of an opening conversation. Then we have the view from Canada. Then we have the view from Iceland. Then we have the accelerated innovation view from Catapult in, in Oslo. And then we're going to open a discussion and then a Q&A. And the speakers that we have with us today we have Kendra McDonald, who is the CEO of the Ocean Supercluster in Canada. And we're very happy, Kendra, to, to have you with us. Welcome. Second, we have uh, Thor Sigvudson, uh, founder of the Ocean Cluster House and, and author of a new book that he's going to be speaking about today. I'm very happy from Iceland to have Thor with us. Third, Icelandic, although he's more of a native Norwegian after all, uh, Björgulfur Hovadsson, who is the uh, innovation manager and, and responsible for research and development with the Seafood Innovation Cluster in Bergen. And then from uh, Oslo, but with a global footprint and definitely a global mandate, we have Ingrid Kjulstad, who is the COO of the Catapult Ocean Impact Accelerator. So welcome everyone. I'm looking forward to interesting conversations this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. So Buggy. Our, uh, our dear Icelandic Norwegian friends, why, why clusters in the ocean space matters? You, um, you find yourself in, in Bergen, the seafood capital of, of Norway, and some would even say the seafood capital of, of the world. Perhaps you want to kick off with a brief introduction to the seafood innovation cluster. Yeah, thank you, Christopher. Christian, um, this is a very uh, happy moment for me to be here. It's the first time I, I joined a webinar, so this is all very new and exciting. Um, to, to, to tell a little bit about the cluster, just to put you into that space, we are a member of a Norwegian government um, 
uh, initiative called the NCE, Norwegian Centers of Expertise. Uh, we have uh, clusters within all the major industries and services in, in Norway. And we serve as a, a national focal point uh, for our respective industries. Uh, in, our, in our case, uh, with seafood as our aim, we are obviously extremely focused on the blue area. We have companies from uh, major agricultural companies, uh, smaller fish farming companies as well, together with uh, academia, startups, and, and uh, companies otherwise in the industry. Uh, I think we are growing at a fairly good clip. I think we are 72 companies at this time. And we have several on the, on the list of uh, application. So we are growing at a very good space, uh, pace and, and, and find that there's more and more interest in, in, in ocean space in its entirety. So that was very short about us. So, Buggy, I want to ask you a, a question. And, and the question that we sometimes get for people that maybe don't know the, the cluster space, they ask, so, so why do we need clusters? Why, do, why does clusters matter? And, and there are, of course, of course, many academic definitions. There are many um, economic definitions. But, but in your words, why, why does clusters matter? Why do we need clusters? Um, I'm extremely operative in my approach to live universe and, and everything. And to me, it is something, the, this is a very quickly growing um, industry in all aspects. Um, and I think quite a number of the issues and challenges and possibilities that we are facing is simply bigger than individual companies. Mm. It's even bigger than individual countries in some instances. So if we don't cooperate, like we see across the board here from Norway through Iceland to Canada, um, we will lose out on a lot of possibilities, uh, working piecemeal, uh, working even against each other in some important issues. There are going to be a lot of competition about the blue space. And if we don't manage that with a powerful clusters and powerful cooperation, somebody else is going to take that bone and run away with it. So it's all about being strong in the area you want to develop. That's my simple answer. I'm not a politician. <laughs> but you could probably aspire to be one if you so chose, uh, but that's a, that's a different story. I'm um, having too much fun here. Yeah. So a lot of industries talk about digital transformation, talk about big data, about sharing data. Mm -hmm. um, what does is, what is data and the digital economy look like in, in your seafood innovation cluster space? Um, from my point of view, it is one of the most interesting aspects of our industry that we are working on right now, together with knowledge development or the, 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 the development of, of competence in all, all areas. But uh, one of the projects we are actually working with is getting all these big companies, many of them are traded publicly. And we are, we are asking them and they are actually responding very well to our wish to, to share data. I think you have a slide I sent you just earlier today, if you just flip it up. Absolutely. This slide has two aspects to it, as I see it. You see this blue line uh, growing incrementally, but fairly quickly. To me, this is one, one side of this is uh, actually companies coming together, sharing data. The numbers on the blue line indicate the number of actual salmon cages reporting daily information in incredible detail into a common database. So we are growing from zero in January 17 to 2,800 last um, August, and we are growing still. So a, a big project, overarching project with a lot of companies, many of them competing. They're actually joining forces to solve some major issues for the Norwegian salmon industry. Mm -hmm. Another one, another aspect of this uh, figure, it's a little bit more subtle, but it's still there. This is the increasing will, ability, and positivity towards working together in a cluster. And this shows literally how a lot of cluster projects start. They start with a little bit of an incredulity or are you sure this is the way to go? And if you do it right, it will grow very quickly. And we see this both with number of participants, but also the interest and power behind it in, in, in Norway. And there are a lot of companies coming too. We will be reporting data from 60% of the Norwegian aquaculture industry come February next year. Today we are about 
So the will and need to solve overarching common problems is a driver. How, how important, the last question for me before we proceed to our, our uh, Canadian guest, uh, how important do you think the cluster is in getting the industry to share this kind of important data? It's, it's instrumental. Uh, and this is uh, not something I, I, uh, I say for my own account. Um, the fish farmers we are working with, which are the major fish farmers in the world in salmon industry, they say without this cooperative project and framework, this would never have happened. They would, have, they would never have found the common ground amongst themselves. So they need that common ground to work on. And, and the clusters are, the, are this common ground, speaking with a very clear voice about what we need to do. It's not more complicated than that. No, as someone who has followed the AfroCloud work for quite some time now, I'm, I'm very impressed with what you've been able to achieve. And I'm, I'm extremely hopeful of what the industry can do you know, once we move from data to insight and actually mm. wins. I'm looking forward to that phase. I uh, so so am I, so am I. So Buggy, okay, we're gonna get, come back to you a little bit later in the in the Q and A session, but thank you for the introduction. And Pleasure. we're gonna turn it over and just give you our um, our guest from, from Canada. Canada, we're very happy to have you with us. Uh, I know you have uh, you've taken on the CEO role of the Canadian Ocean Supercluster, and I know a lot of different clusters, cluster managers, policymakers, politicians, and industry leaders from around the world is is looking towards Canada and trying to learn from the Canadian model. So, I know it's early days, but Kenra, we're going to turn it over to you, and we're really excited to hear your story. Perfect. So, are you able to share what I shared with you, or I need to share my screen somehow? So ideally, you'll share your screen okay. so you can just sort of click through at your pace. Give me a second here. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll take our time to, to get that done. No, no worries. Uh, moment. There we go. Okay. Did that work? Yeah, that worked. Perfect. So, so first of all, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be uh, with you this afternoon and share a little bit of the Canadian story. So, so as you heard, we are early days. So I've been in the role uh, for just over a year, which is actually when we signed our agreement uh, with the federal government. So maybe a little bit of background. So, so we are one of five super clusters in Canada. Uh, the super cluster program was really established to try to change the way uh, Canada was investing in innovation. And so they came up with this, this program, which was really innovative in itself, which was to choose uh, up to five super clusters, which is what we have, which are really meant to be those areas in the Canadian economy where it was felt that Canada uh, could be, um, could compete globally. And so really supercharge those areas. So rather than giving sort of innovation investment a little bit to everyone to really pick those areas where Canada was globally relevant. And so we're really excited that Ocean uh, was one of those five. Um, I'm sure I can do this. And so that led to the Ocean Supercluster. So maybe not surprisingly, so these superclusters are meant to be industry led, which is incredibly important. And, but they are also federally funded. So we are a 50-50 match in funding between industry and government. And we actually can fund projects ourselves. So in my experience in dealing with some of the other international clusters, they pull uh, collaborators together. We can actually fund projects ourselves out of this first run, round of funding. So we are uh, a source of funding, but that funding is really designed to be a tool uh, to encourage the growth of the cluster. So that's a really important outcome for any of our projects is how do they not only move the technology agenda forward, but how do they also contribute back to the overall strengthening of the Canadian Ocean Supercluster? And so we, um, so why ocean? We, we do have the longest coastline in the world. We also touch three oceans, right, with Pacific, Atlantic, and Arctic. So when we talk about the challenges that the ocean is facing, we face those challenges and opportunities in three, uh, along three different coastlines. We have the fourth largest total ocean area. And so when you look at just our natural geographic uh, positioning and you combine that with the opportunity 
that exists in ocean, it made a lot of sense for ocean to be one of, of the five superclusters. Hmm. So then, you know, we, we've made ocean investments before. So, so what really makes the ocean supercluster different than what's been done previously? And it's really this concept of shared challenges. So as we move towards an increasingly digital ocean, what we found in talking to different ocean sectors is that they were facing similar challenges. And yet in the past, they've generally tried to address those challenges in silos. So whether it's offshore oil and gas or aquaculture, or fisheries or shipping, when you actually look at um, the challenges that they're facing, there's a lot of similarity. And so we boil that down into sort of four key areas of challenge and we built the supercluster from there. So the first is cost and risk. So how do we reduce the cost and the risks of doing business on the ocean? How do we increase capability? What does the workforce of the future look like? It looks a little bit different depending on ocean sector, but a lot of the core skills that we need for the future are similar. How do we increase connectivity? So Canada is a very big country. We've got ocean assets across the country. How do we just know what we know essentially so that we're able to collaborate better and build off of existing knowledge hmm. uh, to the comment earlier that's incredibly important. And then uh, connectivity in terms of international reach uh, being the fourth. So how do we both attract interest into Canada, but also uh, look to new markets in terms of Canadian opportunities. So that's really, foundational to how the supercluster was built and really on this concept of cross-sectoral collaboration. And so to the comment earlier, we need to collaborate across uh, clusters. We also need to collaborate across sectors. So we have a very wide um, membership in terms of our sectoral focus. As you can see, we basically look at all of ocean and what we're really looking for is opportunities for those sectors to, to collaborate together to commercialize a new technology. So, so the principle really being that if we can work together in a new way to develop a solution that is of relevance to more than one sector, then that solution should be able to scale more quickly globally. And so that is a real change in mindset. And the principle being that we're, we're trying to change the culture of doing business in the ocean far beyond the life of the current round of funding, uh, which is five years. So it's, uh, it's really a big culture change, uh, not only for ocean sectors, but also for Atlantic Canada in working together interprovincially. And one of the benefits we see for that from a sustainable development perspective is that if we're doing it together, then we're doing it less frequently. And so hopefully thereby, we are being less invasive uh, in terms of the work that's being done on the ocean. So I included here just to reinforce think what I've been talking about, which is some of the areas of common interest. So our technology leadership program uh, basically flows into uh, three main areas, all in the uh, digital space. So whether it's sensing and characterization, analysis, data analysis and visualization, or operational intelligence. So to the comment earlier, data and data sharing and how we facilitate that is incredibly important to the future success of the cluster. And so we are working through some ways of being able to help facilitate that. Um, but that is incredibly important for what it is that we're trying to do. We did have our first project announcement, which was back in June. Uh, one of the challenges, uh, which is it's an, an opportunities for the Ocean Supercluster is we are dealing with um, companies that have never spoken before, which is the magic of what we're trying to do. And so that is creating different opportunities and different conversations, but it takes a little bit longer to then get those projects uh, pulled together, but the pipeline is definitely building. And so where are we today? Just to touch on this for a couple of minutes. So I've talked, touched on the pipeline. We had our first full day of project selection committee, which was very exciting. Um, our membership, so we opened our membership back in May, so we've got 130 members. Those members are spread across nine Canadian provinces in one territory, so we're not quite everywhere, but, but we're getting there. And it spans 13 different industries. Now, again, we're working on our industry definitions, 
but we are seeing that cross-sectoral um, collaboration coming into play. Our design really is, it's not a, a traditional membership model where you pay a membership fee. We actually look at a contribution to ecosystem from technology leadership. So if you want to participate in a technology leadership project, you're expected to then make a 15% contribution to innovation ecosystem. What that also means though, is we have a number of members that are, are members for free so they can join and they can participate in the conversation. Um, so that creates a bit of a, a different model for us. And then we, from an ecosystem perspective, that really is our mandate. So back to that comment on the investment in projects is a tool to, to strengthen the ecosystem and our ecosystem activities are focused on sort of four key areas. So company creation and growth. We don't have the startup and pipeline activity that we feel that we need. So we're looking at trying to double the number of ocean startups in Canada. Inclusive talent attraction, which ties right back to that comment on building capacity. Access to ocean innovation resources, which again ties directly to building that connectivity. And then what this is a part of, which is global cluster collaboration. So we've been very lucky. Everyone has been really, really helpful in sharing their experiences. And uh, so that's been really excited, exciting for us and has allowed us to sort of um, build more quickly. So we are seeing uh, these partnerships that are forming. I can say, you know, when I get, when I ask other clusters about best practices, the one thing that I hear consistently is you can never create enough opportunities for your members within the clusters to interact. That is the number one thing. Every conversation leads to some unexpected and often very exciting outcome. And so we've had a number of events and we continue to look at how we bring people together and we're bringing them together across a very big country and a very big geography. And so, you know, how do we uh, continue to facilitate that in different ways? So I'm excited with this, this webinar technology Hopefully this is something that we can leverage for some of our other activities, but we really are getting consistent feedback that we're, we're seeing new and different conversations and we're very focused on commercial outcomes. So that's one of the big pieces is we've got, um, how do we get research and actually um, have the opportunity to commercialize that research better and differently back to the importance of changing the way that we innovate in the country. So lots happening. There's been lots that we've been doing. We're very excited about 2020. It's our first full year of operation as we move from sort of building the framework into um, doing the activities of the cluster. So, so I'm incredibly, uh, incredibly excited for that. So I'll, I'll stop there again. You know, this really is, it's about cross sectoral collaboration. We really see that as the way of the future in a digital, in a digital ocean. And so we've been really impressed with how, how organizations are coming together in new ways to commercialize outcomes. So again, thank you. And I look forward to the question. Oh, and, uh, and thank you. I mean, that, this, uh, it, it's, it's an impressive story in, in such a short amount of time. Uh, we thank know you. many, many clusters, at least all over Europe that would, you know, they would give an arm and a leg for <laughs> to have this kind of progress in that, in that short, short amount of time. Thank you. So Kendra, we, we, I've uh, I have several questions that I've I've jotted down. So we're going to pick up some questions afterwards. But thank you for for the uh, for the overview. Pleasure. We're going to, we're going to transition over to our um, our next speaker. Um, and and interestingly, you know, he um, he has extensive experience from the same ocean, but a very different place. Um, so I first got introduced to Thor via our mutual friend in in Bergen and. The more I learned about Thor, the more impressed I get. You know, obviously he's been he's been he's been a champion for the Icelandic ocean space, and then eventually for for the, the cluster. And his uh, whatever I hear about him, it comes across as sort of the innovation energy that uh, that he brings. So so Thor, I'm uh, I'm really really excited to welcome you. I'm very happy to have you have you with us. So what is the view from Iceland here? Thank you, Christian, and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, let me sh share with you some of my slides. Um, so how do I do that? That's something. Just on the bottom, it says uh, here. It says new new share, and then you can share your um, your your deck. Mm -hmm. There 
there we go. Thank you. Always good to have <laughs> colleagues with you on this. Absolutely. Same here. So guys, appreciate it once again. And um, I think uh, I've already learned quite a lot. Kendra, thanks for your introduction and Bjorki as well. Uh, let me just give you a short brief on, on sort of my experience through these years. We established the Iceland Ocean Cluster in 2011 and probably what has been notable, not, mostly for us shaping our cluster is that we are not government financed. So it means that we are having to take a little bit different um, business plan into our, into our uh, world. But let me just tell you first what I think is quite interesting for us now in the ocean space. I think one thing is that we find, of course, completely different even from, I feel, from 2011 when I started, that there's more, much more concerns about healthy oceans, which suddenly we are suddenly becoming talk of the town in, in various countries, and not only in countries like Iceland, where, where uh, oceans play a big role. We also see uh, the young generation showing much more interest than in the past. And I think one of the things that we are learning is that rather than asking young generations to study fisheries, we are actually telling them that the environment matters a lot, the ocean environment, and they seem to be joining our movement through new channels, coming with new technology into, into that space and all kinds of new ideas uh, regarding uh, Saving, saving the ocean environment. And then the third that I want to mention is that the startup world is waking up and I think uh, Catapult is a, is a part of that. I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, later on. Just to mention it once again, uh, as Christian did, my book is out in March in the US uh, called The New Fish Wave. And just to give you a little bit of a lesson from, from uh, what, what we are talking about in this book, the idea is basically to give a little bit of a manual of how we did this in Iceland and how, believe, how I believe we can uh, have a similar model in other countries, even though the focus is completely different from where we come from. Of course, our focus has been very much seafood and everything regarding the, the, um, the seafood industry. But to begin with, I, I, as Kendra mentioned as well, uh, the whole thing of bringing people together is crucial, and that is what we call the mapping, just basically knowing who's there. It was a big part of our, I think, uh, later success is to know the big players, meet with them, meet also the smaller ones. And then, uh, secondly, I would like to mention that we started to realize how important it is to have the industry leaders on board. And that's been a great challenge for many of my friends in abroad who have actually been interested in establishing a, a cluster of, of sort is to have the, the industry leaders with them. But for me, it has been the crucial part, extremely important. The third thing which Kendra mentioned as well is bringing down the silos, which is basically what we all are trying to do. I'm, I'm sometimes called the biggest dating machine in baiting, dating machine in the seafood industry. I like that. It's like a matchmaking. And we are continuously trying to find ways to get people to work together. And especially from very different angles, it was a challenge to begin with, but more and more people are understanding that the value in having the academics and the fishermen and the other parts playing um, different parts in the same value chain. And the other thing is also the value chain is changing so rapidly now with all kinds of new services being brought in, whether it is the blockchain, etc. Mm -hmm. Then maybe because of our lack of government funding, we have had a very strong focus on the low hanging fruits, which is not my idea, but a very strong uh, ideology within the, the cluster culture. And uh, I think that's probably where we have focused on and will be focusing on, which is to create new companies with a new startups, create projects within a collaboration units. And we have sold that over to the others are quite useful. And that has also meant that in some cases, our cluster is actually a shareholder of some of these uh, companies meaning that we are being able to finance ourselves a little bit differently from others.
but we've had to do it because the government in Iceland does have it, does not have any funding for clusters or a cluster strategy. I envy, envy my Norwegian friends, uh, but at the same time, I'm continuously in my staff. We have to be on our toes uh, every moment. I'm sure you guys have to do that as well. But at least, it's, uh, I think the low-hanging fruit strategy has come very strongly due to this. And the, fir the, the, the final thing is involving the startup world. And I would like to compliment both Catapult, Fish 2.0, which is a great organization as well, Hatch. So this is very much the movement now into uh, the startup world from the ocean side. And I think it's, it's been for us the crucial part of uh, the whole thing. We did the mapping of this type for Iceland in the beginning. And it was, of course, the fisheries, the ocean technology, marketing and distribution. And I can f forward uh, follow on on that. But the main thing was then the matchmaking. And I'm just tell showing uh, you a little bit of uh, that story there. We started to find ways to get people to talk a little bit more together in various fields. And of course, there have been a lot of talk, uh, talks and discussions and so collaboration between ocean tech and fisheries, but bringing in more R&D education and training, more other areas has been probably our greatest success in the ocean cluster, bring down the silos and at the same time, find the low hanging fruits that can uh, create this collaboration um, culture within the ocean economy in Iceland. So, just a little bit about the startup world. Once again, I must compliment the, uh, the startup uh, organizations that have followed, uh, have, have actually been in the forefront in this area, have made wonders. Because when I started the Ocean Cluster, we felt quite often that we were, uh, we were entering a, a shadow world. There was no interest in, in seafood startups. They seemed to be completely lost. I asked people in Iceland, a group of 100 innovators, at least uh, startup entrepreneurs, to raise their hands. Those of them in, on our island that were actually involved with startups regarding the ocean, no one did. And this is only nine years ago, or, and, which means that we have, we have, I think this is the problem in many countries still, but the, the, the startup world is coming here. And I think our house in Iceland has made a huge uh, breakthrough for many. We have seen there the opportunity um, for the Ocean Cluster House, to which is called Shavar Klasin, you will see on the left on the picture there, where we have uh, created this ecosystem with now around 70 companies to um, connect through the, just the coffee machines and just uh, uh, allow them to create value with all kinds of events and, and things. And I think in many ways, this is probably one of the models that we would like to see elsewhere. And that's what is actually happening now for us. This is the group of, part of the group of the people that's in the Ocean Cluster House. I'm showing it mainly because the fact was when I started the Ocean Cluster House, there were only uh, males in the house nearly. We have changed that through, I think uh, partly through interior design through a little bit more open space through opening up these channels um, with with new types of businesses and what's amazing for us now is that nearly half of the businesses being established especially in the high end of the seafood uh, part of the ocean cluster which is the nutraceutical companies the companies that are doing all kinds of health products uh, even tech companies in the high end they are actually established by women. And these uh, are pictures of some of the women that have been in the forefront in Iceland. Many of them, most of them actually have been in the Iceland Ocean Cluster and the Ocean Cluster House. So we feel that our ecosystem has probably assisted with creating this variety which, which we so dearly need in the sector. But what we realized as well is that uh, when we were looking at our data, we noticed that our seafood industry is quite different from many others. So this picture gives us an indication of how much of the fish is actually being used, not thrown away or used for dump sites in, in, in various countries. And it seems now that through our uh, uh, research, 
Iceland is clearly in the forefront. Most countries that we compare ourselves with are actually throwing more than half or just half of the fish away into either dump sites or on the, into the ocean. And we felt that there was in 2014 already then an opportunity for us to say, we have a message, we have a mission. And we know now that the global seafood industry dumps nearly 10 million tons of perfectly good fish back into the ocean. And we saw our, our opportunity here to hopefully make a difference for our neighbors and hopefully on a global scale by extending the global uh, ocean cluster network. We started in Maine, Portland, Maine, and we're really pleased to see our friends in Maine now opening uh, the first innovation hub similar to what we have in Iceland, in Portland, with, uh, and there seems to be quite a momentum there for, for doing the, a similar ecosystem there where we bring people together in a, in a space where they can share ideas, get the universities involved, the students, the startup world, and create a little bit of a momentum uh, to, uh, and to make a difference. So we also think now that uh, this is uh, going to be the model for success in various other areas. So we are also opening uh, the, the clusters without the houses right now in, in uh, Washington, uh, in, in Massachusetts, and, and a sister cluster is in Alaska, and we're hoping to extend, expand the model. And why is that? I think there are two things that I want to keep uh, sort of mentioning here. First is that just basically our mission is to connect ocean clusters. Mm -hmm. And this is not, there is a reason behind it. What I think is so cool now is that we are very good. We're probably one of the best in the world, Icelanders in whitefish. But we see now suddenly uh, stone crab and all kinds of crustacean shells coming to Iceland. Global warming is making a difference here like everywhere else. We have very limited knowledge in that field. Now connections, both with Canada and with our cluster, for instance, in Portland, Maine, makes us the opportunity for us now to connect <laughs> with these clusters and what we call what we call the law of comparative advantage. So we are seeing all kinds of value in basically sharing knowledge, sharing uh, the startups, allowing them to drop by and share their data and hopefully establish <coughs> collaboration on a global scale through uh, these ocean cluster networks. Just to give you an idea, this is what we call the incredible fish value machine in Iceland. And we're not, we're, we're basically saying we can do everything with the fish now. We can use 100% of the fish and it's actually not drawn by an engineer, but it tells a story. We can do it and we can take this movement all around to make sure that just in the North Atlantic, where we're actually throwing half a million metric tons of perfectly good Atlantic cod into the ocean, it's something that we can change, but we'll change it through the cluster work, just like, like Kendra said, through this uh, collaboration on, on different stages of the value chain. Once again, if you are interested, my book is is nearly out. You can see it already on the website of Leeds Island Books in the US and pre-order it. I hope you're not going to be disappointed. This is a try. What I would like to do is to do like a manual to help people to establish clusters and establish this uh, ecosystem which is so needed in the, in the seafood world and in the ocean uh, space in general. Thank you. Oh, th thank you, yeah, thank you, Thor. Uh, I think that's, I mean, that's an impressive overview, and uh, I think a lot of cluster managers would benefit from your story and also learning from your story. The the fact that you've been able to do this, like you said, without the government funding, and still build it and scale it into a global network, um, is 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 very impressive. And we already we already have the first questions. Now we're going to save the questions for a little bit later, but please uh, audience ask as many questions as you'd like and then we will we'll promise to catch up on all of them so thor you are currently our, our most popular speaker and when it comes to questions that's that's a good thing and i i do i do look forward to your book i think all of us is kind of curious to to learn more about the work you're doing appreciate it and i do of course notice the um the common denominator um when it comes to you know what, what are the Norwegian clusters saying, what's the Canadian saying, what's the 
uh, Icelandic saying, and, and it's, it's an important one. Um, how do we accelerate innovation, create new opportunities, faster, smarter, and more sustainable? Uh, well, probably the best person to answer that is next, uh, from Catapult Ocean. I'm, I'm very, very happy, uh, Ingrid, that you wanted to join us. And uh, you know, tell us a little bit about what you guys do and what you see for the future of, of the uh, ocean, uh, ocean economy. I will, I'll just try to share the presentation first. Mm -hmm. Do you see that presentation? We, we do, we see all slides. I don't know if you want to keep it like that or if you want I'm to put it to full screen. Perfect, thank you. Perfect. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting us to contribute to this, uh, this uh, webinar. It's a really interesting uh, topic and uh, obviously as an accelerator investing in, uh, in startups, we are extremely thankful for all the clusters uh, that are working to really create an, uh, an ecosystem for founders and for corporates and for the whole industry to, uh, to connect. Uh, I thought I'd just, you know, tell you briefly what our vision is. Uh, we are uh, based out of Oslo in, uh, in Norway and we look for startups all over the world to help uh, fulfill our vision, a world where a thriving ocean is in harmony with economic development. So we identify as an impact investor. Mm -hmm. We're looking for startups in the ocean space that, is, uh, that are able to combine sustainability and uh, profitability. So what we do, uh, our business model is to invest in startups uh, that build profitable businesses with a positive impact on our ocean. Uh, but although we're not a cluster, we definitely share the mission that all the clusters are on to build the field uh, and make more people, uh, more companies interested in creating this uh, exciting uh, space. Because if we want to really uh, ensure that the projected growth in the blue economy is happening in a sustainable way, we actually have to accelerate what we call uh, the blue shift in the ocean industries, which is that uh, businesses uh, really think sustainability first when they are implementing new technology and solutions. Uh, when we work with the startups, it's also really important for us to be an active owner and really steer them uh, towards achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals or other impact metrics that they are using to, to guide the development of their business, whether that's reducing CO2 emissions from operations or increasing uh, fish health or uh, electrifying uh, boat operations. So we are not only focusing on, uh, on seafood, uh, we are looking at the whole ocean, but I think what's really interesting with the, with the seafood sector is that it has such an interesting value chain. So many of the solutions that we also find in other areas uh, also applies to, uh, to the seafood sector. Uh, we see a lot of interesting startups in transportation, harvesting, ocean health and new frontiers, not so much in energy, I think, some of the large projects that is uh, needed there, they often come out of, uh, of larger corporates. And uh, what we have done is that over the past year and a half since we were established, we've been building a database uh, to provide us with a global overview of the startup landscape, uh, a pipeline. And uh, as part of our mission to help build this field, we decided to publish uh, the high level data of that database in a report earlier this, uh, this fall. Um, we uh, call it the Blue World Perspective. And our mission is to update that once a year with, uh, with new data so that we can hopefully show that there is an increased uh, growth in, uh, in the startup initiatives within, uh, within the blue economy. So for the next slides, I'm just going to uh, take you through some of the key findings in, uh, in that report. Uh, disclaimer is of course that it is based on our own uh, curated uh, database. There are some uh, geographical areas where we do not have a, a complete overview like uh, China for example or the Korea but I'd say that for North America, for Europe, um, for Africa it's uh, very representative. So we in the, when the report was uh, published, um, we counted 1,036 
amazing startups that were all working on ocean impact uh, technology. And uh, they spread, across, spread out across the world uh, like this. We find 219 uh, ocean impact startups in North America, of which uh, 20% uh, are Canadian. So I, uh, I echo your, um, uh, what you said, Kendra, that you want to build even more startups uh, coming out of, uh, of Canada. Um, Europe is definitely leading the way, uh, and 25% of the Euro European ocean impact startups are from Norway. And I think what we see is that uh, the majority of startups, well, when we see like clusters of startups, they, it's very often because there are good clusters uh, in place. And there's a strong correlation there. Uh, and I think that speaks very much to the importance of establishing good clusters, because not only do you show founders uh, that are, you know, they have an idea, they want to do something, that there is an environment uh, that welcomes new ideas, uh, both in terms of, you know, offering up office space, but also offering up those uh, really important connections to other companies. Um, and also, you know, it gives uh, often a bit more uh, structured access to uh, funding resources. So we do see that we find a lot of startups where there has been a concerted effort to really uh, yeah, join forces between uh, various industry actors, uh, governments. So that's, uh, that's an observation that, uh, that we have made. These are the top uh, countries in terms of in absolute numbers for ocean tech uh, startups. And even though, you know, um, I mean, no one has above uh, 200 startups, right, in this uh, space, according to, to our database. So I still think we all have a lot to do in order to build that, uh, that field even, uh, even further. Um, so what do these startups uh, do? Uh, the majority of them are in uh, transport. There's a lot of uh, innovation happening uh, within that space. And I think one of the reasons uh, are, of course, that the sector is quite outspoken about the need for new solutions. And there's been a lot of, uh, of course, emphasis on, on CO2 emissions over the, the past years. Um, harvesting is uh, second. And harvesting is not only aquaculture, it's also wild catch. It's uh, seaweed, it's uh, uh, other, uh, you know, everything that we can take out of the, uh, out of the ocean. Uh, ocean health is also a very big, uh, big field. And within that space, we find circular economy solutions to prevent uh, pollution, especially uh, plastic, which has been very high on the agenda over these uh, past years. Um, we believe in land-based solutions to stop ocean pollution. So there are some companies here that are land-based and focusing on solutions on land. Frontier technology is a groundbreaking technology that allows us to use and view the ocean in completely new ways. It could be sophisticated underwater communications, it can be drone technology, um, but it's uh, enabling technology. Some of it is not necessarily like direct impact, um, but the founders that we include uh, in, uh, in our batch from this category, they have to be impact driven themselves and be on a mission to use the technology for, for good uh, purposes. And then you have energy being the, the smallest uh, bucket. Uh, the majority of the, of the companies are in uh, the B2B uh, market. Um, but you also see some, uh, uh, quite actually quite a lot that are either B2B or B2G um, or at the same time. Uh, and I think there is uh, definitely a role of clusters there to also work with, um, with governments and authorities to make them good buyers and procurers of solutions also from, from startups. Because like tender that are just impossible for a startup to meet. And I think there is a certain uh, education uh, needed to make uh, a range of actors uh, supportive and interested in, uh, in ocean tech uh, startups. I was really uh, pleased to see your uh, slide, Thor, about all the, the female founders in, uh, in Iceland. I mean, you're doing an exceptional job, uh, obviously, because when we look at the global database that we maintain, it's only 10% of all the founders of the ocean tech startups that are women. Um, which is a really dismal uh, figure uh, compared to 
the the, uh, the like in general the uh, overall numbers for for founders within Europe is thirty percent. This is uh, this is really poor. Um, at the same time, we do see that uh, many women they head up high quality uh, startups. Uh, we do not, uh, we don't use gender as a criteria when we invest, but we have, regardless of that, managed to have around 25% of the startups that we have invested in being founded by, um, by women. But it's, uh, yeah, I think we still have a long way to go uh, before there is gender parity in this, uh, this industry. But it, of course, reflects uh, all the ocean industries in, uh, in general, I, I think. So when we did the report, we also uh, did uh, a survey of uh, just about 40 uh, corporates and 96% of them uh, actually think that startups uh, are working with startups is an important part of their innovation strategy. Uh, but that's what they say. And then there's a huge difference between what they say and what they do. And I think it's a really important task for clusters to help translate uh, between startups and corporates and perhaps also educate uh, corporates a bit about you know what are you know what are startups looking for when they say they need a pilot customer how can you be a great pilot customer uh, how do you make sure that uh, you know you're not just trying to uh, to uh, negotiate exclusive access but rather you know help them build a good uh, good company and at the same time, also uh, educate the startups in, in, the, in the cluster community uh, about, you know, how to have realistic expectations to what the collaboration with the corporate uh, can and should entail. Uh, so I think there is a certain role of a translator that uh, the clusters can uh, definitely uh, have. And I think it's, uh, as we are trying to grow this space, I think it's also going to become an increasingly important uh, role as uh, role as well, uh, which uh, you know begs the always the question about you know how do you maintain neutrality uh, because there is going to be a lot of different startups approaching clusters and, and corporates and I think that's something that uh, as this space grows I think uh, clusters needs to think about that um, but uh, that's something we can discuss uh, more about uh, later on uh, in the presentation. Um, this is one of the reasons, uh, th these are the barriers of innovation that the corporates that we spoke to um, uh, highlighted. So lack of capital for, for innovation was uh, one of them. Uh, and a conservative mindset is actually the most important barrier. And I think, again, uh, these are, you know, these are soft things that can be worked on. And I definitely see a role for the wider ecosystem and the clusters to uh, really, you know, try to create some enthusiasm uh, for working with open, uh, open innovation, which is basically at the foundation of, of uh, all the clusters. So if you, we have a lot of more interesting uh, numbers also for the various sectors and you can download the full report on, uh, on our website. And uh, yeah, I hope you have some, uh, some uh, questions that we can discuss uh, further on. <laughs> And uh, thank you, and I can only uh, only just vouch for uh, for the report. It's it's absolutely worth uh, worth reading. Um, and both from the content, but also that the fact that you're you're putting this kind of uh, you're shining a light on something that's very important here. So <clears throat> I have um, I have just a few questions before we're going to open it up to everybody else. Um, so you all know the traditional cluster structure, the triple helix, where you have corporates and government and academia collaborating. Now, every one of you have talked about the startups and bringing the startups into the conversation, connecting the corporates and the startups. Uh, Kendra, I wanna, I wanna open with you and then I'm gonna pass it on to Thor. What we haven't really talked about is venture capital for all these startups. Because if we have all these startups, but we don't have any money for them. You know, they're going to run out of gas and they're going to die. And then, you know, we're, we're killing this in the early days. So maybe Kenra, you want to start and then Thor, how are you guys looking into raising more capital into this startup space? Yeah. So, so certainly smart capital um, feeds into our, our shared challenges. And so looking at both, um, 
the dollars themselves as well as mentors and the mentor pool that we have. And so we're looking at, so for example, we have CDL Ocean, which is our creative uh, destruction lab here. Um, and so that is raising awareness of the opportunities that exist in Atlantic Canada and attracting investors to Atlantic Canada. There's also an Atlantic uh, Women's Venture Fund initiative, not ocean specific, but also sort of raising the conversation around investment uh, in Atlantic Canada. So um, we see that very much as a part of the success of the startup movement. So our, our role is to, you know, support and to catalyze and, and to help to amplify uh, other activities that are taking place. And so that is, that's an important part of what is taking place in the region beyond the, the supercluster itself. And just a, just a follow-up comment on that, and sorry, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna open it for you. So one of the things that we're looking, looking at is, is how do we get more international funding structures. So just as an example, one of the uh, one of the most successful capital rounds in Europe just recently had, it's a German company, uh, but they have investors from, um, from uh, 10 different countries participating from Sweden and Finland all the way down to Abu Dhabi. Uh, and you know, we have the same challenge in, uh, in, 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 in Norway. Like, how do we connect more international investors as opposed to just local or, or national investors? But Thora, you guys have done something that most clusters are a little bit hesitant. You are investing yourself. How are you guys uh, approaching this, uh, the capital question? Well, just generally speaking, I think uh, probably the, the mindset in Iceland has been very positive towards uh, the startups in seafood. So we are seeing many fisheries, actually successful fisheries, assisting the small startups uh, at, the, at the earliest stages, which is actually quite different from most countries. So we are seeing companies now that are hugely successful, like a company called Caresis, which was founded in the West Fjords of Iceland with investors that included the fisheries and the same as with many others such. Uh, the problem in Iceland has been more with, with regards to when furthering sort of what the value line uh, because the investors have very limited knowledge in the pharmaceutical, uh, the nutraceutical area. Uh, so we have actually been more interested in, in the network that the investors can bring with them. And even though we have positive investors in Iceland that we, we, we of course will approach positively, they do not often provide the network that we need for the expansion, global expansion of companies, especially in the, in the highest end of the value chain. Mm. So it is a challenge for a small country and we're, we're tackling it. Partly it is helping us already to have built uh, the US cluster network and uh, finding ways to open the channels over to Boston and to the, to the New England area, for instance, hopefully to the Seattle area as well. Mm. No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear. Uh, we have a saying that the cluster shouldn't try to raise capital in local bicycling distances, but they should rather connect to international community, like, like just like you're, you're saying. Yeah. Um, Ingrid, what's, uh, in general terms, what's your view on not just the global startup scene, but the global capital scene for the ocean economy and ocean impact economy? Well, I mean, so for our first fund, we managed to raise uh, funding from six different countries. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely some interest uh, in this also outside of the, the Nordics. But I think it's still a lot of uh, unknowledgeable uh, capital in this, uh, this space. And I think we all have a role to play in showing that this is a really attractive sector to invest into. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, yeah. I, I think it's still a little bit of a way to uh, to go. But it's, I mean, the interest is growing and, and we see that, uh, I mean, I just spent a week in uh, in Asia, in, uh, in uh, Hong Kong and in uh, Korea, and there's a lot of people who are, you know, really curious about this, uh, this space. Hmm. So, uh, Inge, what, what are the chances that next year we can have a report on not the global startup scene, but the global investor scene from you guys? 
Well, then we need to have some more people on our team then <laughs> to manage to, to do that. Uh, I, I think for, for us, we're now like focusing on uh, finding great startups to show investors that there are fantastic uh, opportunities to invest in uh, companies that can uh, grow rapidly, uh, that are employing new technology and really helping uh, helping a, a crucial sector uh, to make take more sustainable choices going forward. So I think for at the time being, I think there's we still have a, a big uh, role in just showing that there is an investable uh, amount of uh, of uh, companies. Hmm. Buggy, I want to I want to put a question back to you. Um, so now we have a Canadian perspective, we have an Icelandic perspective, and Inge is basically bringing a global perspective. What are some of the smart things that we can do to collaborate better? Uh, and I'm actually going to use the word collaborative, collaborate more intimately on, a, on an ocean cluster to cluster relationship. So, Buggy, I suspect your audio is, your microphone is muted. I'm usually not muted, so this is a new experience to me. We have a different clusters with, with um, not different approaches, but different setups. So, um, like I said earlier, my mind is extremely um, operative. Um, and I think what we have to look at, our, we have to look at ourselves like a cluster of clusters. And the best glue you can get into that business is finding a common project. That's how we, I mean, it's all about just start working together and, and find that way. And I don't have any immediate answer. I'm not a magician, but I think if, if we talk more together, if we invite, contribute, uh, I have the absolute pleasure of, of sharing office space in Iceland two or three days every summer. It's always inspiring and interesting. Uh, it's a little bit longer trip for me to uh, to visit Canada, but I think the answer lies in collaboration, finding that big project we can collaborate on. I'm yes. open to, I'm, I'm really open to uh, ideas. So, so let me ask this one question and then uh, Buggy, you go first and Kendra, I'd like to have your view as well. Uh, what would have to happen for you guys to do, let's call it management exchange programs, so, Buggy, you have to go to Canada for two weeks and actually work as an innovation manager in Canada. And Kendra, you have to come to Iceland or, or Norway. Uh, and Inge, you got to go, uh, well, let's send you to Iceland. And really find the time to spend time and invest time in a different cluster. Buggy, what, what would that require? When can I, when can I fly? That would be my aspect because this is a really good idea. And like I said, start working together. That's just a different version of what I said, but I do agree. And that would be a very good way to start to learn the ropes with each other. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm free on January 5th. <laughs> That's the best time to come to Canada, right in the middle of January. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I, I concur. I mean, I've had the opportunity to, to travel around a bit and, and meet with various clusters and I, I always learn something. So to have the opportunity to be immersed, I mean, we've been very focused on kind of just getting going, but the, the capability and the talent exchange piece, not only within the cluster itself, but um, within some of our projects, we see that as a, as a big opportunity going forward. The mechanics of it, we'll figure out. I think the key is just having two parties that are willing to make it happen, and then you just mm. work through and make it happen. I do agree. I, I think that would be a wonderful uh, way to sort of see those clusters grow better relationships and, and collaborate even more, like, like you're saying. Uh, yeah. We're going to open up for, uh, for questions from the, the audience here. And the first question was actually, how do you make money? What's your business model, Lor? Well, uh, I was just trying to reply to it on the computer. We have around 20% of our income comes now from uh, uh, membership fees. It's down from nearly 70% as our income has increased. And then we have around 40% coming from uh, successful operations that we're now actually a part of. Uh, startups that uh, have been already operating for some years. Mm -hmm. And then 40% will be both advice 
direct uh, contracts with individual companies where they are they want to uh, make us be, become sort of the matchmakers and international partners for certain projects. And now, we'll just uh, take a follow-up question. And I know you've, you've replied already, but I think it's good for everyone to, to hear it. So we have a question here from Costa Rica um, to Thor. Uh, what do you look for? What do, you, what do your companies look for in a potential partner for a hub, innovation hub or a cluster hub outside of Iceland? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually addressing this in my book. I would think that I have sort of five or six points to make there. Just very briefly, first, we want the base industry to be there, uh, being whatever it is, if it's the fishing industry, seafood industry, we want strong seafood companies to be there. We want also some leaders from these industries to be a part of the, the establishment of a, of a cluster or, or an innovation hub. We want the closeness of universities, universities and R&D. We want, want cluster knowledge and we want uh, at least interest from government, hopefully being a strong R&D environment in terms of grants. So these are the elements that we look for uh, when, we are, when we are surveying different areas for possible clusters. Hmm. Great, and um, I don't know if you need an invitation, Thor, but I'm pretty sure that uh, Roberto and the uh, ecosystem in Costa Rica would be very happy to host you for at least a few months every winter. I'd love to. I'd love to. Um, Kendra, I want to I frame the next question to you. This is a question from, from Catherine, and most likely she is just picking up somewhere in Australia or uh, Ireland or somewhere. Um, your, your supercluster initiative is still fairly new. Uh, for most ecosystems, the idea of clustering, you know, it may take some time getting used to. So, Catherine's question is, have you generated a, a code of practice or expected behavior for your members in the Ocean Supercluster? So, uh, so not yet. Um, I think that the, right now we've said that the principle is we want to see cross sectoral collaboration. That's kind of our, our big behavior change. Um, and we're looking at geographical uh, collaboration to some extent as well. We, we have talked about uh, now that we have a few of our first project discussions under our belt, what are some uh, guidance or communication on, on what best practices look like, but we haven't had enough of a track record yet uh, to really um, to establish those. So, so that, that's where we are. Well, kind of a, a follow-up question um, on that, Kendra. So you have, you've had the CEO role now for just about a year. Mm -hmm. And if you look back, what's been the biggest crisis or maybe the biggest learnings for, for you in, in that role? And I think there's a lot of people around the world who has that question for you. Uh, sure. So, um, so one of my biggest learnings is collaboration is really easy to say and really hard to do. Uh, so when you start to get into the nuts and bolts of what a collaborative relationship looks like and you're having the really hard conversations around data sharing and IP sharing and, and where the value is going to go and how you're going to work together day to day, that's not easy. And then you expand that out to working with a sector that you've never worked with before that makes it even more challenging and sort of a tied learning to that is the culture in each of the sectors is very different. So now you're trying to change, um, you know, you're trying to change overall culture, you're trying to change culture within specific sectors. And to some extent, we're also trying to change Atlantic Canadian culture. Uh, so really exciting, but that has been, um, it's, it's harder than it looks to some extent, we can say it, but when you get into the nuts and bolts of what, is, what, what does that really mean for me? Uh, it is, uh, it's not without its challenges. To, to build on, the, on those challenges and under the umbrella of, uh, of international collaboration, what would you like to see from, let's say, mentors? Let, let, let's just assume for, for, for a second that Ingria has, you know, some people on her team with a little bit of availability, you know, they, they have a lot of working capacity. So how can her community contribute to, to the work that you're doing? Um, and vice versa. 
Yeah, so, so certainly as we're, we're building um, capability and capacity here, we're really strongly, we're trying to be aware of programs like, uh, like Catapult Ocean and encourage more Canadian companies to look globally and to participate. Uh, we're also hoping as we have more activity in Canada and we're already seeing that and it's not only the ocean supercluster, it's also Cove, which is the Center for Ocean Ventures uh, in Canada, as well as Ocean Frontier Institute. We're one of a number of things that are taking place. So that is attracting more attention in terms of coming and seeing what's happening in Canada and possibly uh, participating. My hope too, and we've had some of this conversation, again, we're early days, is you know, there are other examples of where you had international collaboration and, and one country funds sort of their activity based on their guidance and Canada funds based on their guidance. So we're not quite there yet, but I'm very hopeful that just um, the, the interest and in the conversations will lead to a desire to work and collaborate internationally on certain topics. I mean, you know, we already, as a good example, we already had a session together during our ocean. Uh, so there is uh, some collaboration uh, already happening. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear, and, and it's interesting because in, in uh, ecosystem studies and ecosystem reports, they very often talk about the, the strength of the ties and the strength of the bridges between different ecosystems, referring, for example, why Stockholm is doing so well. Well, some would say that it's because Stockholm is so deeply embedded into Silicon Valley, into London, into Berlin. And you know what, what I'm hearing here is, is, of course, the need for even, even more collaboration across the oceans, uh, so to speak. Uh, Ingrid, we have, a, we have a question for, uh, for you. Um, how do you measure your impact? Or maybe more specifically, how do you measure the impact of your startups? Uh, yeah. you and, I, and I think just also on the, on the, on the question on the collaboration, I saw who's posted that question and, you know, that's the Ocean Hub in uh, South Africa. And, you know, we already had many discussions with them and uh, shared some of our experiences. So, I, you know, I feel like this space is still quite small. Right. Uh, so I think for all the uh, actors in this ocean clusters, um, it's quite easy to, to reach out to each other and uh, and actually, you know, exchange experiences. So we have to kind of uh, yeah exploit that to, to the extent possible. So how we measure our impact. So we have our own uh, impact framework. Uh, we evaluate the startups. Um, both from a sustainability perspective and also then on the impact uh, perspective, like how much can they, for example, reduce uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, we use established uh, standards and we set uh, company-specific KPIs uh, that is relevant, whether that's you know reducing bycatch or reducing CO2 emissions. It, it has to be quite uh, very tangible and very operational and directly related to what the, the startups uh, are working on. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so we have about one or, or two minutes left, and I want to I want to frame one last question to each of the uh, each of the panelists, uh, and I'll ask for a sort of a, a, a short and snappy answer. Um, but yeah, I'm going to start with you, and then Kendra and Thor, and, and finally Inge. And the question is really: over the next say ten years, next ten years, what do you think is is the biggest uh, the biggest trend that we need to address collectively? from all of our different angles and positions and clusters. So the next 10 years, the, the ocean economy, what's the biggest thing you need to Buggy, you want to take that first? Yeah. 10 years is an incredibly long time in, in any area. But um, what I think we will all have to face, and none, none of us can actually look away, is the environmental changes that we are facing we as an industry need to face them on, on part of our countries and on part of our members. And this is the one big major common issue we all are facing right now. And that is um, different changes and Tor mentioned uh, different types of crabs moving into Iceland. Um, those are kind of beneficial species as they generate revenue and, and can be managed in that way. There are also visitors knocking on our doors who are not friendly and invasive species. And some of them may bring with them challenges that we are not ready to face. Norwegian government is using annually about 50,000 US dollars to manage invasive species. It's a joke. Some of the scientists are actually diving on their own free time. Um, 
so if we don't start actually facing up to these challenges, uh, we can pack, uh, pack already now and find something else to do. Because this is a major challenge. I'm sorry for being such a spoil sport, but you asked and so you will be answered. No, I think uh, big challenges requires big thinking. So, so Kendra, yes. what So I'm looking at the brain power in front of me here. Yeah, so I mean, I think along similar lines, so that balance of, of production from the ocean and, and protection and how do we truly sustainably uh, develop, economically develop the ocean and have a, a, a educated conversation around the trade-offs when we're making decisions around ocean resources. So I do think that is an incredible challenge for the next decade. Thank you. Uh, Thor? Yeah, I completely agree. I think we are, we're, we're witnessing here in Iceland, in the, in the north, how our oceans are getting hot, sour and breathless. So it's absolutely the, the biggest challenge. What we can do, a small fishing nation and other nations, small like ours, uh, basically I think we need to be a good example. And we can be that. We can make a difference with all kinds of green technology that coming from the, these, uh, even some of the villages around uh, with regards to uh, our technology, our utilization of the resources that we have uh, feeding the world uh, with our uh, methods. So I think we have a, we have a large role to play, but uh, the problem is significant and uh, we are living these, these uh, times now of, of, of uh, significant risks with regards to the health of the oceans. Yeah, I, I, can only, uh, I can only echo that, but I think also sustainability has become a hygiene factor now. So uh, the question is more about how do we create the first uh, ocean unicorn that has net zero emissions or that really, you know, harvest within uh, the limits of resource, uh, of the resources we have available to us. So I think it's now it's more about, you know, are we able to really build a company that is uh, compatible with the climate and environmental challenges that we are up against? And I think uh, if we uh, are thinking about the challenge as investors and as uh, corporate clusters and as industry clusters, I think that's the one big challenge that we have to unite around and really enable sustainable ocean industries to uh, to thrive and, and scale because you know there's still a way to go there and i think uh that part of the conversation needs to happen later a later stage but i think i think all four of you have framed you know big challenges on, on relatively short timelines so more work and definitely more innovation is needed uh, and, and all the best to you uh, Inge, Kenra. Again, Thor, uh, thank you for joining. I, I see we have more questions coming in. Uh, we'll save those for, for another time. Thank you all for joining and for our uh, audience from Canada, from US, Costa Rica, South Africa, um, Ireland, Europe, Asia, and beyond. Uh, thank you for, for dialing in. All the best in your innovation effort, all the best in your cluster development, and, and anyway, uh, all the best to building the world's leading ocean impact accelerator. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you, and have a good evening. Have a good morning, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Christian.